Okay, Dan, you talked about the uh, you are not your own. So I'll let you speak on that. Hmm. Okay, so, you know, the the theme kind of takes us, uh, uh, you know, into scripture as always. It takes us into Corinthians, actually, uh, chapter six. And if we will start at verse 15. Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of a harlot? God forbid. He does forbid. <laughs> That's prohibited for you to play both sides. You can't be a Christian and a legalist at the same time. Then verse 16 says, What know ye? What? Know ye not that he which is joined to a harlot is one body? For two, saith he, shall be one flesh. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Flee from, flee fornication, every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which, or the Holy Spirit, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price, therefore glorify God, in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So our life force and our physical body is the property of the creator. Now, in the world of legal and those who play lords and gods in a legal sense, kings, queens, Governments, presidents, whatever, they take the role of being a god, but they're a false god. They're not a true, they're not the true god. Um, and therefore, they had to mimic their basically leader, which is Satan, who desires to have what was of God's authority, and he wanted the creation of man. So he brought them into lies and fiction. Um, and therefore, he created these legal edition uh, titles, uh, which can be assumed by, can be claimed by none, but assumed by anyone. And so his whole world works on assumption. And when you assume this legal status, you're no longer operating in your position with God. And therefore, you're in an adulterous uh, public position because now you're part of the common public uh, uh, society or aggregate, and therefore you're nothing more than a legal debtor. So very important. Uh, there is an article that you can look up. You are not your own. Uh, your body does not belong to you. Do you believe this? I don't mean doctrinally believe it. If you're a Christian, you, of course, believe that you are not your own. Of course, quoting Corinthians, where we just read out of. I mean, you do, do you functionally believe this? It's not difficult to tell. How you use your body reveals what you believe. It can be difficult to admit if we feel exposed by our functional belief. Believe me, I know. I have plenty of functional beliefs that fall short of my official beliefs in varying degrees at varying times. The question isn't an exercise in shaming, uh, for you or for me. It is an exercise in honest assessment, in reality therapy, and if needed, in repentance, which for Christians should be just a normal everyday experience. As Martin Luther famously said, when our Lord and Master Jesus Christ said repent, he intended that the entire life of believers should be repentance. All of us fall short of the glory of God. None of us has arrived. God knows this part, uh, this far better than we do, and he's made abundant provision for our shortfalls. Each time we repent, each day, even each hour, Jesus' substitutionary atoning death for us cleanses us from all unrighteousness. 
1 John 1, verse 9. God wants us to live condemnation-free, Romans 8, verse 1, by taking full advantage of his endless supply of forgiving, restoring, encouraging, and empowering grace. Since all of us redeemed short fallers are in fight of faith together, we can keep encouraging and exhorting one another every day to press on towards the great goal, Philippians 3, verse 14, so that none of us becomes hardened in deceitful, habitual sin, Hebrews 3, verse 13. With God's wonderful grace in mind, we can take a good, honest look at ourselves and ask, do we really believe that we are not our own? Do you not know? Let us look at these spirit-inspired, Paul-authored words in context. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. Uh, when Paul asked, do you not know, he was addressing Christians. And he asked the Corinthian Christians this question a lot in, his, in this letter. Now, some Corinthians were probably new believers and perhaps didn't know. But Paul phrasing, Paul's phrasing of the question makes it clear that he was giving a firm reminder to those readers who doctrinally knew, but whose behaviors revealed that they functionally forgot. More poignantly, they were living in functional unbelief, which was real sin and required real repentance. They knew and they didn't. Isn't that really what's going on right now? So people have deceived themselves. They've lost focus. They thought when they just accepted Christ that that wasn't going to require the old creature and who they would have been deemed to be in the legal collective part of society. And they didn't realize that they would have to lose or shed off the old creature. And so symbolically, when you really look at why legal society operates as it does it represents the old creature denying the new creature's existence it doesn't want to see the salvation because it works on fee penalty and fine you would have to deceive the world into believing there is no free grace or remedy in order to operate a legal society and they know that the majority of people who have spent their time in legal society have invested so much into the legal body corporate of the legal last name that they have empowered that they would never give it up they would never let go of what they believe is their vested interest in not obtaining the rest of god Can so, i just make a comment sure uh, it, it was it was kind of interesting how he divided the two different beliefs in that document uh, functional and official beliefs. Is yeah. that kind of the same thing as like a pseudo-Christian uh, in the church? Has it's probably official... not the best wording <laughs> to an extent, because when we use the word official, we usually mean it in a public sense. Right. Um, and, and so we're, you know, the we're not official in their world. A Christian name could not be official. So it's it's a matter of uh, it's a matter of you know uh, you know being clear on our words. Everything you carry when you, you know there there are birth records that say this is an official legal record, but an official legal record has to be signed by officials, and nobody who operates with say even the birth records. And I was That's quoting cool. out of uh, actually they have it here. I'm quoting out of, say, this record here. This is one out of New Brunswick. And it clearly says this is a uh, official uh, document. And of course, it's signed by officials. But is the name that's on there controlled by a non-official? No. But what happens is a non-official assumes and acts upon basically what the majority of the blind will do. And so they they assume official activity with the public official name, which is not theirs, and then they make a private claim to it by assumption, even though it can be claimed by none, but is allowed to be assumed by anyone 
because of the free choice to elect to contract. So you have an you, official belief when you walk into court with that name. That's an official belief. Yes. And so because you've contracted with the state and you are acting in fiduciary assumption as a trustee, not realizing that you're not a beneficiary to legal because you're not the one who invented or forged that forward, that concept. So this is manufactured evidence from someone who's manufacturing these documents. And therefore they have a patent on the machine and what comes out of the machine in production, in issue. So are you the issue of legal or are you something that comes from God? And because the two are in dispute, in conflict, until you make the proper elective choice, and only the truth will make you free or set you free from this uh, assumption of legal bondage. But would you be willing to give up all legal interest to do that? As scripture said, you came into the world with nothing and you would leave with nothing. So why are you trying to accumulate legal treasures on earth? Why are you possessed by your possessions? Because Satan has entered you and he requires your consent for him to take possession of your mind, your temple, and your heart. And it is very, very important for us to do these soul-searching moments of thought. And uh, therefore, when we were going further on this, we were just getting into the next section uh, who owns your body in 1 Corinthians 6.19, Paul was specifically addressing sexual immorality among believers, just like our society, the Corinthian society, had a lot of a valuable, uh, available, accessible, culturally acceptable, and even encouraged ways to immorality, immorally indulge sexually. Very likely, many Corinthian Christians had backgrounds um, with immorality. They had habits of thinking and behaving sexually that will affected, that still affected and tempted them as Christians. Some apparently had been repeatedly falling short. More than this, they were actually rationalizing it with a common adage, food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food. In other words, look, if the body has an appetite for food, we feed it. So if the body has an appetite for sex, we should feed it. Besides, we're free. Jesus' sacrifice made all things lawful. Paul responded with a frank correction. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. When we become Christians, our bodies become members of or appendages of Christ's body. And the very spirit of Christ dwells in our bodies as the spirit used to dwell in Jerusalem's temple. Implication Every sexually immoral behavior a Christian engages in drags the Lord Jesus Christ into that engagement. That's why sexual sin in particular is a sin against our own bodies. In Christianity, there is no uh, bifurcation of body and spirit. Both make up the human being. To defile one is to defile the other. Both our bodies and spirits, though still vulnerable to sin and the futile suffering of this age while we wait for our full redemption, are nevertheless being redeemed by Jesus and will be raised. So our bodies must not be given over to sin's governance because our bodies do not belong to us. You were bought. But is this how we live? Do we knowingly behave with our bodies as if Christ is engaged in our physical actions? all of them or do we not or or do we not functionally know in describing the ways we are not our own paul used the metaphors of a bodily member which does the will of the head then a bodily temple which is animated by the divine spirit who lives there then a bond slave who does the will of his master that's what paul meant when he wrote for you were bought with a price a bond slave is not his own person. <laughs> Interesting is that. <laughs> well, we'll use that more in the context of a bond servant. <laughs> it's not his own person. <laughs> because he's under contract with the master who runs the persona. 
He has sold himself to someone else. He belongs to someone else. He does not merely do as he pleases. His time is not his own. He is not free to follow the whims of his personal dreams. He is not free to indulge in the craving of, the ap of his appetites as he wishes. He is not his own. He belongs to his master. This is what a Christian is. Freed at a great cost. This bond slavery of a Christian, however, is like no other. Far better than any alternative of autonomy. Our master bought us with a price of his own infinitely precious life in order to make us free indeed. John 8, 32 to 36. What does this mean? It means that when, when, we, when he bought us, he freed us from our hell-bound slavery to sin, Romans 6, verse 6. He also bought us uh, the priceless gift of being adopted by the Father as his very children, which makes us heirs with Jesus of his Father's kingdom and of infinite wealth, Romans 8, 16 and 17. If that wasn't enough, Jesus, our master, both now and in the age to come, serves us beyond our wildest thoughts. Mark 10, 45 and Luke 12, 37. But gracious as he is, Jesus must still be our master, which means we must obey him. John 14, verse 15. For our master is whomever or whatever we obey. Romans 6, verse 16. As Christians, we know this. The question is, do we really know? Is Jesus the master over our time, expenditures, home, size, location, education, career? Now, he's going a little bit more into the secular part here, so I'm just reading this as he put it. Uh, parenting, friendships, church involvement, and ministry commitments. If not, we do not functionally know what we think we know. Glorify God in your body. We need good, honest self-assessment. What is the spirit bringing to mind right now? In what part of your life have you functionally forgotten or better functionally not believed that you belong to Jesus? What are you stewarding as if it is yours and not God's? Um, sorry, what are you stewarding as if it is yours and not God's? Follow the Spirit's lead and repent. Your gracious Lord and Master stands with scarred arms wide open to receive, forgive, and cleanse you. You and I are not our own. We are Christ's. In every sense, we are Christ's body, mind, and spirit. We are members of Christ's body. Our bodies are Christ's temple. We are bond slaves of Christ, who had made us children of his father and fellow heirs of his estate. What a master. He is only, however, the master of those who obey him. That's why it's crucial that our functional knowing aligns with our doctrinal knowing. Or as Paul said, you are not your own, so glorify God in your body. Now, other than a little bit of a clerical misunderstanding, because he was still touching into being in the persona and secular in that second last little paragraph, um, more than not, the writing's good, as we can see even with John MacArthur in Slave, even though he said a slave has no rights, but then immediately he has no legal rights. So how could a slave of Christ um, be moonlighting into legal and claim legal rights, which only come for legal participants who have elected away from free grace? So anyways, great little, uh, you know, little read if you get a chance. Uh, other than a little bit here and there, as was in, uh, you know, the book Slave with John MacArthur. You have to be careful because these are not uh, men inspired of God. They're doing their best to try to read the scriptures as they see it. Um, but we have to make sure that we stay within the insp inspirational record we find in the Bible and not waver from that to our own thoughts and rationalizations. We need to read the truth as the truth is laid out in the word. Can you just uh, um, read slowly the name of that article again, just for the record? Here? Yeah, it's called You Are Not Your Own. It'll be the only one that shows up under that. Okay, so just type that in Google. Yes. Okay. It's on a site called Desiring God. All right. Great. Thank you, Dan. Okay.